Hello, one and all. Welcome, welcome, welcome to uh, the RealWorks Town Hall on Access and Inclusion. I'm here at the RealWorks office, uh, and you are there at home or in school or some other place out there in cyberspace. And we thank you for joining us here. Uh, pull up a chair, and we invite you to join the conversation. Uh, we ask that you turn your cameras on whenever you're sharing, since this conversation is interactive. Uh, the program will begin in a few minutes. Uh, but we'd like to present you with a slideshow with and a little behind the scenes look at our Youth Ambassadors program and bios from our panelists and moderators. Also, we're going to be sharing a poll on Zoom. Uh, so wherever you're from, uh, warm up your fingers. We'd love to hear your thoughts. And welcome back. Uh, and thank you once again for joining us. Um, it looks like the results for our poll are in. Uh, the question was, do you feel everyone has access to work in the media and entertainment industry? Uh, about 13 of you said not at all, but a whopping 87% said it has gotten better, but needs work. And I love that, I love that. Um, I'd like to give you an introduction and uh, thank you to our RealWorks ambassadors. Octavia, Chi, Aman, Maya, Noor, Shu, Bree, Katrina, and Sean. Like, thank you so much for organizing this event with RealWorks and for keeping youth voices at the forefront of this town hall. So the youth ambassadors have had several conversations over the past month about this very topic. Um, and now I wanna turn your attention to a short video um, highlighting some of those conversations before we break into our bigger conversation with our panel. The word accessibility can also mean problem solving. There might be people, people out there who may be very disadvantaged, no matter how disadvantaged they are, you know, there's ways they could still be part, you know, of, of, of this industry and this community. If accessibility is gonna be like prioritized more, then we should be like educating more people in like the subject of filmmaking. Accessibility to those like high level positions and those writing rooms are so important because while we do have some representation right now in mainstream media, I think a lot of it is watered down and whitewashed. There's kind of like this idea that people with disabilities aren't really interested in doing any of these things or they're not even capable of doing them in the first place, which is beyond false. Really anyone, if you put your mind to it and you have the accessibility to this program that could also give you, you know, an access to the industry. I feel like that's a really good step. People from other communities, such as the disabled community, LGBTQ, you know, minority communities, how can they, uh, you know, be part of this industry? The ideas and the things that I want to put on the screen are really nuanced in a way that young people like myself and others would be interested in because we don't see that on the screen. If you have more people represented behind the scenes, you'll have media that represents the world more accurately. I want to do something with my eagerness to kind of see depictions of myself in the media. I feel like at the end of the day, your story is important to someone. Your story is relatable to someone. As soon as we get, uh, you know, people who can actually relate to these characters, people who can actually have like access to make something so like authentic and real, like, that's when we'll really thrive as like not only an industry, but as a society as a whole. Thank you, ambassadors. Having the teenagers having these conversations, when I was 16, this was, this was not the conversation I was having. So it's super, super exciting to see young people involved in this way, to see young people uh, looking for answers and like taking control of the paths that they're taking. Um, I wanna introduce one of those young people. Uh, uh, who will be moder moderating, uh, Sean, is from our Narrative Lab and one of the RealWorks ambassadors. And uh, along with him, the amazing journalist, documentary filmmaker, and board member for RealWorks, Shrezy. Sean, Shrezy, thank you for being here. Take it away. 
Thanks so much for having us. We're so excited to be here. Welcome everyone. Um, I'd like to formally introduce myself to the group. I'm Tracy Tandon, and I am the very proud board member of RealWorks. I've been a part of this incredible organization for close to four years now. And I am particularly honored to be a part of this conversation tonight because it's something that is close to my heart. So just to give you a little background, um, I am not only a woman, but also a woman of color. I am Indian by background and I never had a godfather or mentor or foot in the door to the media or film industry, but was fortunate enough to carve out a career path, both as a journalist and subsequently as a filmmaker. So this whole topic and conversation we're having tonight surrounding diversity and inclusive, inclusivity and access and how do we get you know, of our foot in the door is something that's super close to my heart. So thank you. And I'm so excited to have this conversation with our esteemed panelists and to hear all of your thoughts and insights. I am also excited that my co-panelist for this evening and my co-moderator is Sean. Sean, would you like to just introduce yourself as well to the group? Um, hello, my, my name is Sean Panyan. I am um, a Nether Lab student and a youth ambassador. And it's nice to um, see it, like see in everyone here and be part of this, this event that um, I know that it will be something great. Well, I'm honored to have you as my co-moderator, Sean. Um, before we kick off this evening, I do want to start by recognizing the original people of this land, the Lenape, as well as their deep connection to the Lenape Hoking homeland. Real Works also acknowledges uh, the systematic exclusion and erasure of many indigenous peoples, including those whose land this organization sits on. This acknowledgement of the Lenni Lenape people and this land calls us to commit ourselves to learning how to better ourselves, to be better stewards of the land that we all inhabit. Um, in this vein and on this topic, I also want to quickly express our desire to create a really safe space in this town hall meeting this evening. Um, as a group, we agree to engage in ways that are respectful, comfortable, open, curious, honest, and most importantly, kind. This allows us to communicate with each other in a safe space that's free of conflict and harm. Um, I'd love to get a, a yay from the group. So either unmute yourself and say, I agree, or you can just put a thumbs up icon in the chat uh, so that you're on board to this agreement of kindness and um, creating a safe space this evening. Um, lastly, uh, also in order to make everyone feel very comfortable this evening, if you'd like to add your pronouns to your names uh, here in, on Zoom, please go ahead and do that. We welcome everyone and encourage all of you uh, to make use of the chat at all times. Any questions, thoughts, comments, um, we're, we're all ears. So thank you. And without further ado, let's let's kick off this town hall. Um, thank you, Tracy. Um, again, my name is Sean. And I also want to thank RealWorks and our youth ambassadors for leading these conversation, conversations. This is the third RealWorks town hall, the first one being a social justice and reform in response to the Black Lives Matter movement. And last year's was, was on inclusion. The town hall is a result of the youth wanting to express their concerns and mobilize in a brave space. RealWorks has been a leader in the youth filmmaking space for 20 years, working with motivated, diverse young people in middle school, high school, college, and beyond from across New York City and nationally. Since the pandemic, RealWorks has partnered with partners like Paramount and Warner Media to teach young people to use filmmaking to respond to is issues impacting their communities. For example, the Paramount Content for Change Academy is a pilot program that places participants from non-traditional backgrounds in three-month full-time work in various Paramount Global Divisions. Uniquely, they receive one-on-one -on -one mentorship and access to an online resource library for career development. This town hall will investigate how more people can have access to working in the media and entertainment industry. 
and share some adult and youth perspectives. Before we start this conversation tonight, I just want everyone to be really clear about a lot of the words that we're going to be using, uh, specifically diversity, inclusion, and equity. I know we hear these words bandied around constantly, but let's get some clarity on what these words actually mean and how they differ from each other. So let's start with diversity. Diversity is the practice of involving people from various racial, ethnic, social, economic, and cultural backgrounds and various lifestyles, experiences, and interests. Inclusion. Inclusion is the practice of providing equal access and opportunities and resources for everyone who might otherwise feel excluded or marginalized. So the importance of inclusion today is that it is purposeful. It's active. It's an active way of involving others in all our decisions and in all our spaces. To simply be invited into the room is no longer enough. It's no longer inclusive. Rather, you need to be seen, be heard, be respected and appreciated for your presence. And your insight uh, is a part of a meaningful conversation that's inclusive. Equity is giving more to those who need it in proportion to their own circumstances in order to ensure that everyone has the same opportunities. And accessibility is giving equitable access to everyone along the spectrum of human ability and experience. Accessibility refers to how organizations make space for the characteristics that each person brings to the table. All right, so I would like to now uh, focus on our four amazing panelists this evening. They are from various different walks of life, backgrounds, identities, and career paths. And they're here to talk to us about their experiences in the media industry. And really, hopefully by the end of this evening, we can all have a little clarity on the question, what does it take to gain access to the film and the media industry? Okay, let's see if, um, I would like to remind all our panelists this evening before we start, if you can please, before you answer the first question that comes your way, please just state your name and your affiliation uh, for the very first time when you start speaking. That will be very helpful to all our ASL efforts. Uh, just be mindful of the deaf and hearing community as well and create space for them. So perhaps um, right before a response, if you could just give a pause or give a pause right after your response. Um, and if you would also like, you can use the hand raise feature to answer a question. All right, so we're going to launch the poll now, um, which is what do you think is the number one reason that this industry is so difficult to break into. And some of our options are, is it because it's all about who you know? Media tools and equipment are expensive and hard. Is it competitive? Is it that the industry is too big and it's hard to learn? Please go ahead and make your selection. Okay, we're gonna give everyone just a little bit more time. Okay. All right, so I would like to now uh, focus on our four amazing panelists this evening. They are from various different walks of life, backgrounds, identities, and career paths. And they're here to talk to us about their experiences in the media industry. And really, hopefully by the end of this evening, we can all have a little clarity on the question, what does it take to gain access 
to the film and the media industry. Okay, let's see if, um, I would like to remind all our panelists this evening before we start, if you can please, before you answer the first question that comes your way, please just state your name and your affiliation uh, for the very first time when you start speaking. That will be very helpful to all our ASL efforts. Uh, just be mindful of the deaf and hearing community as well and create space for them. So perhaps um, right before a response, if you could just give a pause or give a pause right after your response. Um, and if you would also like, you can use the hand raise feature to answer a question. All right, so we're gonna launch the poll now, um, which is, what do you think is the number one reason that this industry is so difficult to break into? And some of our options are, is it because it's all about who you know? Media tools and equipment are expensive and hard. Is it competitive? Is it that the industry is too big and it's hard to learn? Please go ahead and make your selection. Okay, we're gonna give everyone just a little bit more time to answer. Okay, here we go. Here is the result of our poll. So 70% of the audience thinks it's all about who you know. Wow, okay, that's super interesting. And then of course, the next one is that media tools and equipment are really expensive and hard to access. And almost sort of even across the board about it being competitive and also just really vast to navigate. Um, super interesting answers. Thank you everyone for participating. Okay. All right, let's take a moment to introduce our panelists uh, before we start firing them with some questions. Um, for the panelists, please describe yourselves when you, when you introduce yourselves. For example, my name is Sean and my pronouns are he, him. I have black hair and I am wearing a black jacket. Uh, hi, my name is Kaya Nelson. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. I'm a real works ambassador and a young filmmaker uh, with our documentary lab. And uh, for my answer, I chose media tools and equipment are expensive and hard to access. Um, though I do believe it's all about who you know, I think first you need to have the opportunity to experiment um, with something that you are interested in, or even if you don't even know, like you're interested in it. Um, and I think that like, especially in our schools, many students aren't even given the opportunity to experiment with film. I mean, you watch a film, you're like, hey, that's cool. And you move along because you don't really have the opportunity to kind of experiment with the tools or with the camera. Um, and so I, I think that's like the first step that we need to take is integrating film into like school programs, but yeah. Um, Cavell, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yes. Um, hey everyone, uh, my name is Cavell Brown. I use he, him pronouns. I have about short curly hair. Um, I'm wearing a black turtleneck and I have caramel skin <laughs> and the and I'm a, I'm a partnerships manager on the social impact team here at LinkedIn formerly did social impact at HBO and Paramount 
Um, and the answer that I chose was, is about who you know. And I wish there was a all the above option <laughs> because I felt like all of these options attribute to barriers for folks. Uh, but I specifically picked who you know because just working in the media entertainment industry, I see that a lot of it is like, who's gonna send that referral email? Who's gonna put that script in front of that, that development executive? It's some people just move out to LA to just try to figure it out, just to meet the right person at the right party at the right time. Um, there's so many, there's so few spots. Well, they make it seem there's so many few spots. So that's why I chose that. Um, it's K though, by the way. Thank you for clarifying. And I apologize for mispronouncing your name. Um, next up, we have Shelly. Shelly, could you please introduce yourself? Yes, of course. Every, hello, everyone. My name is Shelly Guy, and this is my sign name. And I am the Deaf Community Coordinator and Assistant Director of Events for Body Language Productions. And as um, everyone has mentioned, all of the above would be, would be the ideal answer. But I really feel that there's not deaf writers for various characters that could go more in depth to deaf identity. They write for, hearing writers write for deaf characters, but it's not the other perspective. And obviously we witnessed a Oscar win and it has been 35 years since Marley Matlin had won that award. But we look at that and we think, you know, there, there hasn't been that many improvements since then. We need deaf artists, deaf writers to represent us. And I think that that is essential right now. That's so true. Thank you, Shelly. Next, we will introduce Andy Morganander, who is the co-founder for the Justice Film Collective. Um, Andy. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Andy. My pronouns are she or they. Um, I am white. I have curly brown hair and braids, a green polo and big gold hoop earrings. Um, I completely agree with my co-panelists. I think so many of those answers are interconnected. And for me, if I could have clicked two, it would have been the financial barriers and the who you know barrier, because in my experience, those things go right together. And especially from an independent perspective, a lot of the time I'm in a position where I'm trying to um, apply for grants or get narrative funding from specific programs that are geared to, you know, maybe female or queer or gender fluid filmmakers. Um, and they're asking me, you know, for references or my previous work, um, but I'm submitting, you know, my previous work that's ultra low budget or my references that are outside of the industry because I live in North Carolina. Um, so I don't have the who you know to get the finances. And it's often this catch 22 of, I need the finances to get the work to meet people um, and the other way around as well. So it can be a, a tricky spot to be in for sure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andy. And last but not the least, um, we have Sean Senevirante. He is a director and a film and media instructor at the Brooklyn Steam Center. Uh, thanks so much, Sean. Yes, my name is uh, Sean Senevirante. Uh, my uh, pronoun is he, his. Um, I am a Sri Lankan brown skinned with wavy hair. I'm wearing a button down shirt with, I believe, or poppies, I don't know, some pretty flower on my shirt. And um, yeah, I'm a director and a film and media instructor at the Brooklyn Steam Center. For this question over here, I think there's like so many different ways of responding to the question. Um, you know, I do think it is a supremely competitive industry. You know, it's an industry a lot of people want to be doing because it's awesome. You know, we watch these stories. We want to be a part of media and entertainment. Um, that being said, when we're thinking of competition, it also depends on like what aspect of the industry we're trying to get into. You know, there are aspects of the industry where there are more barriers to entry purely because of competition, right? If you want to become a showrunner or a director um, that's like making studio movies, that's going to be a totally different like pool. And it's going to be a much smaller pool because 
how many people period are making studio movies every year, maybe like 50. So, um, you know, that's a different conversation than like getting onto the crew side of things. But I do think who you know really does factor into it. And who you know, there's another way of thinking about that as well. It's not just about like, oh, I know this one person that's gonna help me introduce, uh, introduce me to this person and then I'll be able to get where I wanna go. Um, I think it's really just about who you know and who are your peers on like every level. And it's about forming these authentic connections because these are the people that you're going to be making movies with that when you're ready to direct something, they'll crew for you, you'll crew for them. So it's not just about like always looking to level up, but who are the people that are around you and how can you all bring yourselves up together? So, you know, there are a lot of ways to think about that, but for me, who you know and the competitiveness, competitiveness of the industry um, are the biggest factors. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to start off this evening by posing to you the question, what is, I suppose, the biggest barrier to entry that you personally experienced when you entered uh, your space and started your journey? Um, Kay Val, would you like to start off by answering that question? Um, you know, you're, you're at LinkedIn, one of the most recognizable uh, media companies in the world. Um, you're a black man and you are at a se very senior position. I can imagine your journey was not short of um, many stories, a lot of ups and downs. Would you care to share how um, how your experience was? Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you for asking that question. Um, it's really interesting um, because I ended up in the media entertainment space, just kind of a lot of serendipity. I'm, a, I'm also a man of faith, so I believe in you know, God just placing me there. Um, and I literally interned at HBO in the social impact space. Um, by going to an event at HBO, mind you, I'm from Queens, never been there before. And I just, <laughs> right place, right time, met one of, one of my former colleagues, her name is Mary Johnson. And um, we just, I just shared my heart at a reception. And I was like, hey, like, I want to do social impact work. Like, I really care about this. And, you know, I was interning at JP Morgan at the time. And she was like, hey, like, send me your resume. And I think, you know, I think it, it doesn't, it seems frictionless because of like how it happened but I think about like that I was what 22 at the time 21 at the time and that was my first time in that building that was my first time I really had never interacted with the HBO brand before like for me to even apply for that internship to even get there I had to be in that space right at that at that specific time at the specific moment and we think about the window the we think about opportunity and I love the, the analogy of like windows and you figure out like how big is someone's window versus how small someone's window is. And if you look at it, that, that window was a moment, right? It wasn't like a, re a recurring thing over and over and over again. It was one moment that led to something else that led to a career in this space. And I'd say that's a barrier in and of itself, you know, of why the question is, why is the window so small? Right. So that, that's what I say, like I, to, to put it in one, to put it in a couple of words, it's really that 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 proximity, that that cultural awareness. Right. To even know, like, hey, this is a space that I can imagine myself in. You know, I'm from, you know, I'm from public housing in Queens. Like, I never thought that that would be the case. Wow. I mean, it's absolutely incredible just to hear your journey. And yes, you're so right when you talk about those, those small windows, windows of opportunity, but why is the window so small? Um, Andy, I'm curious to hear from your experience. You know, you're, you, you have a film company now, and as you say, you're not in LA, New York, or, um, you know, sort of any Mecca that's really recognized for filmmaking. So geography as well, I suppose, has posed a, a barrier for you. But beyond geography, you know, what has been the biggest barrier that you've experienced? And I, I'm really curious to ask you this question because um, it's almost diametrically opposite to Keval as a white woman um, navigating the space. Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you. And this is Andy speaking. Um, 
you know, I went to school for acting first. I was an acting major. And I would say, you know, because of my privilege as a white person, that felt like um, a pretty open space to me from a, from a racial standpoint and um, from the standpoint of gender identity, from a, from a female standpoint. That was the first place I would say that I experienced um, barriers or, or harm or abuse even because of what, you know, directors and casting directors would ask of, you know, both myself and, and my friends and my colleagues um, in school and also outside of school in the film industry. I went to school in um, Baton Rouge, so was auditioning a lot of New Orleans. Um, and so I would say that treatment and, you know, of course, mine was specific to my identities. I was seeing other friends, you know, get stereotyped for different reasons or be mistreated in different ways that were unique to their identities um, and experiencing and seeing uh, that mistreatment from the actor perspective is really what made me want to pivot um, and be on the other side as a director or producer so I could hopefully um, change the systems and prevent that kind of mistreatment from happening from an independent filmmaking perspective. Thank you for, um, for sharing. Uh, Shelly, I would now like to ask you a question, um, which I'm sure our audience is also super curious about. I know I'm curious is that I'd love to know how your individual identity, um, how that played a role when you started navigating your space in your career. Um, not just as a as um, as a white woman, but also as a part of the um, the deaf community. Okay, well, I work in the entertainment industry, but the real challenge there is because, as you can see, I use sign language, and so I don't use my voice. And for me to be able to represent myself, I have to coordinate that through an interpreter. And that can be a challenge because there's a lot that comes with that. Access in the space, full access in a room with a bunch of hearing people. I can't directly communicate with everyone. So I have to have a second or third person basically become that um, mediator between those languages. So I have to explain and educate at the same time as informing them. And that can be a real challenge in the industry. Additionally, as you mentioned earlier, it depends on who you know, who you know in that space, the networking you've done, who you've met. And when I access that space and it's full of hearing people and that's that industry, I have to start somewhere, right? How do I start that? Creating those steps. Now for the last few years with Niall DeMarco, who won Dancing with the Stars, he really paved the way for many within the deaf community to access that space. And after him, Lauren Ridloff, who was involved in the Marvel um, movie. So this is, is a way that more representation has been exposed, but it's not enough. We need more of that. And I hope to see more improvement going forward. Sean, I'm curious to ask you as, um, as a director at the Brooklyn Steam Center, um, are you starting to see companies adopt best practices in a way that is substantially moving the needle? Oh yeah, this is uh, Sean uh, from Brooklyn Steam Center. Um, and yeah, absolutely. So like, you know, uh, the Brooklyn Steam Center for those that don't know is a public school in Brooklyn on the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And it's a CTE high school, meaning it's career technical education. And we have a film and media program over there. So it's a lot of hands-on work that's all about creating. And we're in a unique position where we have industry partners being on the Brooklyn Navy Yard, people that are on our board. Um, RealWorks is one of our industry partners as well. Um, and uh, yeah, like absolutely, um, these companies are starting to um, really, you know, open up their, their pool of candidates and who works for them. Um, in our school, uh, students get internship placements. And so these uh, companies have all come on board to say like, we are going to be taking Brooklyn Steam Center students as interns. Um, and they also do a really great job of like hiring students back when they come back for the summer, bringing them on for more work. Um, so they've been really, really awesome about it. So I'm definitely seeing that like at 
within our school community and the businesses that we're associated with, like all the companies are like totally on board with trying to make this change. That's really reassuring to hear. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Kaya, I'm I'm curious to to know from you, um, you know, as a young black woman uh, coming up in the space, do you feel like you are represented in the media that you consume and all the stories that you read and and watch? Um, I remember ten years ago, or maybe even fifteen years ago, I didn't really feel very seen um, as an Indian woman in, in media. I thought there were a lot of caricatures and there was a lot of stereotyping around what it is to be Indian or Asian. Um, I'm starting to see a massive shift uh, in that direction. I'm curious to know whether that's also being experienced by, by folks such as yourself. Yeah, um, I first want to apologize for not saying my physical attributes. I'm wearing a green shirt and glasses and big old headphones. Um, uh, I would say for representation, um, I feel like what I've been seeing often on media recently is a profit off of Black trauma. Um, and it's it's when I often talk about representation in the media and how Black women are portrayed in the media, um, there's often like backlash uh, that like we are in the media and we're like, you know, we're, we're all over. Um, but mostly what I've seen is stereotypes. Um, I've seen, you know, white directors and white writers kind of write black stories and very like violent black stories, you could say. And it's very um, off-putting. So I think that I mean, for me personally, I just want to see, you know, like a teenage black friend group kind of just enjoying each other's company and, you know, having a normal life um, instead of including, you know, just black trauma, I guess you could say. Um, and yeah, so I feel like within the industry, there needs to be a focus on not profiting off of other races, uh, horrific experiences and instead focusing on you know their humanity um and you know humanizing them more in the industry hmm. interesting shelly i would like to also throw that question to you and um i'm i would love to know whether what you are seeing on television is it authentic to your experience and as a side note um was coda for those of you that watched it, was that, did that feel like an authentic representation also? Well, partially, I feel that representation is always evolving and that there's always room to grow. The deaf identity is a multifaceted identity that spans language, community, culture, and the experience of a human being. It's not just that the world like barely sees our humanity. Media shows only part of our multifacetedness and this representation is growing, but who is telling these stories? Who is writing these stories? And for whom are those stories written for? So the majority of deaf stories are about, are written from hearing people and deafness is often used very superficially or only used to support the bigger story. CODA, as you mentioned, is a recent success shows there's only more room for growth. Additionally, it's a, it was about, you know, it's a white woman whose deaf family, but it wasn't about the deaf family. It was about that woman, that hearing woman's journey. Additionally, social media has only begun to let deaf people be seen. And at last, our language is visible and our presence is not translated or ignored but we need more work on that. We need more stories. And again, they need to be written by deaf people. Thank you for sharing. Um, this, this question is for Sean, but any, um, anyone else can also like answer them. Um, question is, um, what inspired you the most to enter the in industry that you're currently in? Cool, thank you, Sean. Um, and uh, 
Sean Cinebrotney, Brooklyn Steam Center. Um, so to enter the industry uh, that I'm currently in, you know, I'll answer this in two different ways. So um, as a director and as an educator. Um, so as a director, you know, just always wanting to make movies. Um, but I knew there was like this particular kind of movie that I wanted to make and the way I wanted to make movies. So I always knew it was going to be really involved with like producing my own work and like doing things um, pretty independently because one thing that I wasn't interested in um, is how I use my creative energy. You know, creative energy, I think, is a very sort of like hard thing to, to grasp and also to sort of like keep a hold of and kind of keep protected. And it's possible to enter different sort of jobs and careers where, you know, your creative energy um, can get sapped out of you. So. Um, in knowing that I wanted to produce work, I knew that like maybe going into um, commercials wasn't necessarily going to be the route that I was interested in. Um, you know, I would, um, and then crew is is great, but um, I it takes up so much of your day. It's like you know, it's a it's a major major commitment. You know, it's an amazing path to take, and when you want to create that own work, you're creating opportunities with all the connections and everything that you're making there. Um, but you know, you're working like a 16 hour day if you're going into overtime, right? It's gonna be really hard to come home and try to put that creative energy towards any project of your own that you're working on. So, um, you know, I grew up on punk and hardcore and I wanted to be a part of something that was just going to, um, I knew I'd be contributing to the world in some way and be helping out um, young people and just showing them cinema and getting them interested in movies. So that's how I got into education. It was a way to really like, kind of always constantly be refining my creative sensibilities and coming up with ways of engaging and understanding also what young people are interested in and ways they want to express themselves and trying to provide those tools. Um, and, you know, I do learn as much from them as they learn from me. And uh, I think that's really important. But I think, if, you know, for me entering the industry, it was really important to sort of separate like what is my creative energy for my own work and what is the kind of energy I want to put out there into the world um, and the impact I want to have through my job and career. Thank you for sharing. Um, Kevella, um, I want to ask you, now that you are where you are today and you've clearly earned your stripes to get here, you know, you've interned at HBO, JP Morgan, now you're at LinkedIn and many other experiences in between. Now, presently, do you feel included where you are? Do you feel like you belong in this field and in the space that you're in? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's a really, really help. First of all, Kayvel, um, and speaking, um, I think it's a really interesting question to, to ponder, right? I think when you, when you're in spaces that are really homogenous, and you know really are have a certain way of thinking a certain cultural fluency or cultural language to them um it's hard to say hey do i feel belong do i feel like i belong and if you examine your own definition of belonging and you think about like if you belonged at home if you belonged to your friends is that same feeling the same feeling that you feel at work or in these spaces or in these like predominantly whatever institutions and there's always a dissonance between those two things of, you know, even like code switching at work, which seems like a nominal topic, but like, it's real, like the way that I'm showing up at work versus the way I'm showing up with my homies is try to, is two separate things. And I'm trying to blend the two to like make them make sense. I mean, y'all going to get this slang, y'all going to get these, these bras, these ums, these all this. And I'm trying to bring that two together. But I think you know, in the social impact space, which I've really, most of the time I've occupied, I do feel included in a lot of different ways, but sometimes I don't, um, you know, it's really interesting to see like in the social impact space, like the people who are furthest from the harm are usually leading the work, which is the question of deservability really comes into play of, you know, who deserves to be in exposition, who deserves to be in this spot. And I think it's, all coming from a scarcity space of, hey, like there's one leader, there's one SVP, there's one founder. And it's like, how can we all live in harmony with one another and really blossom? And I think that's the question that I ask myself. And that's the tension. I think that's the tension that I live in of, you know, 
being having to do <laughs> labor to live, right? Like that's the tension I live in. That's so interesting. You know, I love what you said just now about the people that are furthest from the harm are the ones that are actually um, trying to do the work or, or trying to take leadership roles in the work. I feel like that almost mirrors what's happening so much in film film as well, is that the folks that aren't Black, that aren't, you know, don't have a disability, that aren't uh, from a minority group, they're the ones that are writing the roles and, and, and writing the scripts and picking up the awards. Um, Shelly, I'm so interested to learn if the challenges that you face in the entertainment industry, how, what are your unique challenges? Because I'd love to see whether they are, how different they are from, from the rest of, from the rest of us. Um, is, is it just about uh, the inability to communicate like everyone else that you think is the greatest challenge or are there others as well that perhaps we don't know about? So financing is always a big challenge, right? And it's not only because the deaf community has less access, but because of the very nature of interpreting. To access such spaces and networks, we have to be able to speak and write effectively. And so our power and our access is limited by the fact that we have to pay for interpreting, which means less networking, and more expenses on like the clerical operations instead of the actual art. So any space out there is virtually always designed for hearing people. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah. So that is a, a definite challenge. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you for, um, for sharing. Andy, um, how do you stay motivated when it is so difficult for even the most talented and most connected folks in the industry to get a film made, to get a TV show greenlit? Um, how do the folks that perhaps don't have that sort of access, um, what keeps you going and persevering? Um, this is Andy, pronouns she, they speaking. Uh, I think that's a great question. And one I ask myself frequently as well. Um, I would say it's hard some days, um, especially when you are self, uh, self-employed or trying to work as a director or producer outside of the industry. There isn't always a map of how to get where you want to go. Um, but for me, I'm deeply passionate about the impact of my actions and my scripts. Um, and I think remembering and really coming back to my true north, which is that, you know, while I'm here on this earth working as an artist, I care deeply about collective liberation and my role in collective liberation. And with all of the processes um, that I hope to implement on set, with all the movies I hope to make, and that's the goal. And so, you know, for me, it's coming back to that. It's meditating on that. It's my filmmaking being a spiritual practice and it's being in community. I mean, Sean spoke about this earlier, but I, I love filmmaking because it's collaborative and, um, you know, surrounding myself with people that also share those values, but that also, you know, will hold me accountable, will check me, will um, critique my work as well, helps me to keep going um, whenever my energy gets low. And I will also say I'm, I'm really inspired by other artists that started by making micro budget movies, you know, like Issa Rae, you know, doing a Kickstarter for the misadventures of awkward black girl and, um, you know, Barry Jenkins and Ava DuVernay doing their super low budget films before they got to the place in their career um, that they are now, you know, looking at the beginnings of people's careers that maybe we don't hear as much about um, really motivates me that starting small um, matters and that you can get where you want to go, but sometimes it's just about finding the right path. Mm. That's so true. John, as an educator, what advice do you, do you have for students such as myself um, considering higher education? Um, can you share some pros and cons for, um, for you when making this decision? Sure. Uh, so uh, 
Thanks, Sean. Uh, I'm Sean Sundaratni, uh, Brooklyn STEAM Center and director. Um, so advice for students considering higher education. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough question, um, you know, but like any higher education endeavor, it costs money. Um, and if you're not able to get financial aid, um, uh, then loans are a definite thing that you need to take out. Um, unless you're born with a silver spoon in your mouth and there's someone that can pay for your college education, um, debt in so, at some point in your life is an inevitability. So I think one thing is just, you know, coming to terms with the, like, all right, I'm studying the thing I wanna study. Um, I'm gonna incur some debt. Am I okay with that, right? Cool. You know, I grew up in an Asian household and, um, you know, I, the arts were not, and my parents love it now, but um, at the time, you know, they wanted me to be a pharmacist and, you know, a lawyer and like whatever, all the things that um, immigrant parents typically want their children to do. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of those factors to consider when um, thinking about higher education. That being said, I do think um, college and film school, um, is an amazing, amazing experience because you're using that time. If what you want to do is um, work as an artist, you're using that time to start to develop yourself. You're using that time to develop your eye, to develop your craft, to meet people and to create work. Outside of a school structure, you have to be very, very self-motivating, um, which isn't always an easy thing to do. And I think we probably all find that after we finish school, like, you know, it's basically up to us to do the things that we want to do. So I think, you know, there's, there's that factor. And like, you're in an environment where you're going to grow and you're going to grow with your peers. Um, and I think that's, that's really great. It also opens you up to a lot of other perspectives. So not just the film classes, but English classes, science classes, philosophy classes, all those things, you know, have an impact on how your mind is developing and how you're developing as a person during that time. Um, so I'm like super, super pro. That being said, you might already know like college isn't for you and you might be wanting to get started in a different part of the industry. You're ready to just start. You want to work on set, you know, um, you want to start crewing, you want to work as a first AC or like, you know, start as a production assistant and move up the ladder in some way. There is no barrier to entry in terms of higher education for that. That you just need to start um, PAing. And then, you know, I mean, that's easier said than done. And that's something for us to talk about as well, right? Like, how does one start PAing on, like, you know, through um, uh, the New York City program um, and the New York uh, NYC PA program um, for to work on TV shows like Law and Order and stuff like that? How do you start making these connections when just like independent films and start working with folks over there? Um, one thing that I do is whenever I, uh, produce a short film, I'll bring on students of mine as my crew. Um, I don't believe that, I think we need to not be afraid to take on someone that's green. Um, we're always saying, oh, but they don't have experience or they need to get it. Well, no one's going to get experience on you unless you provide the opportunity for somebody to get that experience. And most things in our industry is teachable, right? So we need just a little bit of patience. Um, and then making sure we're bringing on people, young people that are ready to um, ready to learn and continue to grow. Um, I brought one of my students on in my last short film um, as a script supervisor, and she is a super strong student of mine. Her name is um, Abby. Uh, I'm sorry, Taylor McNeil. Um, super strong student of mine. Great editor. Um, I brought her on as a script supervisor because of the work that I saw her do in class. Um, she did such an amazing job with script supervising and I saw her attention to detail, her attention to the emotions, her attention to everything that's happening over there. I thought, why shouldn't she edit this movie? I've seen her edit. I saw what she did on set. And so then I asked her, do you want to edit this? And she's like, are you sure? I was like, yeah, 100%. I mean, I'm going to be there every step of the way to coach her and to help her out um, and you know, to encourage and to answer questions. But um, I think we need to learn to give up a little bit of that control and just start to open up those opportunities that that can exist wherever we can we can make it happen. So, trying to summarize that, um, college higher education awesome to take advantage of, but you got to make sure you're really taking advantage of that because you don't want to be spending all this money in school and like not giving your all on these projects and not trying to make the best movies you can and not trying to um, make as many connections with your peers as
think let's give Sean a couple of seconds to see if he can reconnect. Um, okay, let's let's move on and hopefully um, Sean's connection resolves itself. You know, listening to Sean's, oh, Sean, there you are. Sorry, you actually cut out for uh, probably a minute. Okay, he's frozen again. <laughs> okay, well, we'll continue and I'm sure Sean will jump in um, in just a minute or so. You yeah, know, sorry, one of the things- I got disconnected. Oh, there you are. Let's just uh, pin you to... Um, there you are, okay. I'm sorry, Sean, we lost you. Would you like to, um, I think you were summarizing your um, your thoughts for us. Oh yeah. Um, so yeah, just to summarize, higher education is um, can be an amazing experience. You are going to incur debt, but once you accept that, you know, it's inevitability for most folks. Um, if you're going that route to try to make the most of that experience, to try to produce the best work, you know, and never think of like your school project as just a school project. Every project is an opportunity to make something totally amazing and to challenge yourselves creatively. Um, and for folks where higher education might not be what they wanna do and they're ready to start working, um, to start making those connections to local film crews, independent groups, like PAing on your, your friend's music video, or looking into programs like the New York City Governor's Program for the PA program to get that foot into the industry, but also as an appeal to everyone that potentially could bring young people on board um, to just not turn someone away because they might be a little bit more green, but to provide that opportunity for them, just knowing that everything, most things in our industry is teachable. So we just need to have the patience to be able to do so. Um, and then that could be really empowering. Mm. I love all the advice that you gave there. So thank you for, for sharing all of that. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of nuggets there that um, everyone here can use. You know, one of the things that you um, that you didn't specifically say, but you really metaphorically described it was how you played uh, the role of a mentor uh, to your student by giving her that opportunity to be a script supervisor, by allowing her to edit your, your film. And I think the role of mentorship is so pivotal in, in, in any industry, um, no matter what your career path, path is. Uh, Keval, did you have a mentor or do you now have a mentor in your life? Um, if so, you know, what, what's the role uh, that mentor has, has really played for you? Yeah. Um, thank you for, thank you for asking that. This is Keval pronouns, uh, he, him, um, and speaking currently. And yeah, I have a couple. I have a couple of mentors in my life that really are just amazing people who just really pour into me in so many different ways. Whether that's spiritually, whether that's career wise, whether that's just like, hey, like let me just give you uh, a, a, a shoulder to lean on or to to, to think through things. Um, career wise, um, a person that I give a ton of honor to and just like an amazing human being. His, his name is Dennis Williams. He is the head of social impact at Warner Media, and he's just been this phenomenal, phenomenal person in my life. I worked for him. That was my first job out of school, and um, he just he just held me down in so many ways. And it was just beyond the career space. But there's something about someone who will hold you down through your mistakes. Someone who is going to give you that grace is going to cover you, even though you mess up. And that was Dennis for me. Like he would say to the team, like, I know KVL is not, you know, doing this, that, and the third in the best way possible, but I believe in him. Here's how I want him to grow. Like I'm holding him down. And that's huge. Like there's one thing for someone to champion you, but there's another another thing for someone to cover you. And that that's 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 amazing. Um, I hope that answers your question. Yes, it did. Um, I personally really believe in in the power of, of of a mentor, and I urge everyone out there to uh, seek for one. I know there's a saying that your mentors choose you; you don't choose your mentors. But uh, it, you know, it it is a dynamic relationship. I'd love to see a show of hands um, from everyone here 
how many of you have a mentor in your life at the moment? Okay, that's a lot of hands. And how many of you believe in the importance of having a mentor specifically in a career? Okay, wow, it's unanimous, um, amazing. Well, thanks for playing that game, everyone. Um, so beyond mentorships, uh, you know, one of the things that was absolutely inevitable to everyone was COVID. Um, it impacted all of our lives in so many different ways. Um, Andy, I am curious to know from you how COVID impacted you and then um, once you're done answering this question, Kaya, I would love to hear from you as well. Um, you know, as an established filmmaker and a budding filmmaker, what was the role that the pandemic played in your lives? Um, Andy, would you like to start first? Sure. Um, this is Andy speaking. I feel like there's just so many answers to that question. Um, so I'm I'm thinking about it in reference to filmmaking. I feel like you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, when we were on lockdown, I think it asked me as an independent filmmaker to expand my definition of community, because all of a sudden I couldn't be in my physical community with the people that I was so used to getting my creative energy from. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a very in-person kind of person. I love to be in physical space with people and I'm very social and just get a lot of my sort of like love and fuel from being in physical space. So at the beginning of the pandemic, um, when there were just so many things happening on Zoom and, and virtually, I started to work with a group called Indie Media Arts South. Um, that is just a group of filmmakers, programmers, all sorts of different people within the industry. Um, I was a part of, and, and still am a part of this like ethics and film group. And it really helped me to connect with people outside of just North Carolina. It's predominantly filmmakers in the South, um, Southeast. So I think that expanding that definition of community was um, a really positive impact actually of it that has stuck. And I think now what maybe New York or LA felt really far away at the beginning, pre-pandemic, but now that so much can be done virtually and is being done virtually, I think a lot of the different film communities feel a lot closer than they did before. I also think in terms of on set, um, the pandemic and having different protocols around COVID and different people having different needs um, based off of their ability or their identity in relationship to COVID brought in a new need for communication and consent on film spaces that maybe people weren't thinking about before. Um, so I definitely feel like it's increased awareness around um, ability and accessibility and different protocols and health and mental health on set in a way that maybe wasn't as much of a norm beforehand. So I think that's how, that's how it impacted my filmmaking. Interesting. And I think I'm, Oh, I was just going to say too, like, I think I'm still processing it. Like it doesn't feel final. I still feel very in it. So I've said that in a very complete way, but um, I think it, it actually still feels like it's an on, ongoing relationship that's, that's forming and reforming. Yeah, it is. It's, it's definitely very fluid. Um, what about you, Kaya? Uh, well, I'm currently in high school and the school that I attend is all about self-motivation. Um, and that, clearly becomes very difficult uh, when you're in the midst of COVID and, you know, you're at home and you're not really seeing anyone. Um, and, you know, our, my school is very centered around like the arts and theater and film in particular. Um, but I found that when COVID hit, a lot of students kind of lacked that interest in either one of those things, because both of those, you know, you need a community for both of those things. Um, and so a lot of people felt very lost in their hobbies. I know me, for me personally, I kind of didn't really know if film and theater was something that I was interested in anymore because of COVID. Um, but then I, I kind of realized that like I was spiraling to a place where I was just like, I don't really know what I wanna do, even though I know I'm really into film, but it seems like that's not possible. 
Um, but I feel like many of like many other students, I had to kind of look through that. Um, and I just started signing up for like other film schools that I could attend online. Um, and I mean, it took really myself and my loved ones to kind of like push me to really adventure the film industry more. Um, I was more into like playwriting and theater uh, beforehand, but I think COVID kind of pushed me more into film. It was definitely something I was studying beforehand, um, but I, I really dove into it. Um, and I can't say this for like, you know, every other, you know, youth filmmaker, um, but you really have to have, you really had to have like that self-motivation during COVID to kind of break out of your shell. Um, I mean, now that we're kind of going back to normal, I feel like, you know, for the people who did continue to, you know, push in their, in, push their interest in like, um, in film, they've come back with very amazing stories. And I think that some people really took advantage of COVID and, um, use their time usefully and, you know, took, you know, that loneliness and that time to themselves to kind of create interesting stories. Um, but, you know, I can't say that for everyone and that's very unfortunate, but for me personally, I, I think COVID kind of gave me the opportunity to self-reflect and, you know, really put myself out there, um, with film, but yeah. Yeah, no, that's so true. Um, I think it gave a lot of people, um, an opportunity to not just slow down, but also maybe consider a pivot um, in, in, in many ways. We have a question from the audience. Um, someone is asking us actually just to follow up on that mentor conversation we were having. Um, and I'm going to actually leave this open for uh, all our panelists, which is what is the best way in which you can find a strong mentor? you raise your hand i will i will just call on you to answer the question what is the best way for someone to find a strong mentor yes kaya uh well you know as a student i mean creating a strong relationship with a teacher um can be a lot more helpful than i think people realize um teachers are kind of there to help you out and to help educate you. And so often they don't mind, you know, creating a more like, you know, personal relationship or just helping you like one-on-one -on -one with certain things. Um, so I mean, just take advantage of every opportunity. Like don't kind of look at a teacher as like someone who you just have to like, you know, follow and or whatever, but someone who can help guide you in your interest. Um, so yeah, I mean, I personally have taken advantage of real works and they've giving me opportunities with um, mentors, which I am so grateful for. Um, but, you know, if you don't have the opportunity to be a part of a program like RealWorks, I think, you know, really taking advantage of the teacher-student relationship um, and, you know, just hearing out your teachers because they have great input most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I agree. I think definitely leveraging the relationships you have in your life around you. Um, and making the most of those is, is definitely a great way to start. Um, okay, let's carry on. We're almost at the end of our questions. Uh, Shelly, I really would like to know from you, what is the most um, impactful piece of advice that perhaps you have received uh, personally from someone or you have learned that you have implemented for yourself and it's served you really well? To trust myself. It's really important when you believe your goals and you envision what you want to achieve. And the creative arts are essential to trust the work and to bring in a team that supports, becomes that support system for your goals. It starts with you and your dream, but once you get that community involvement, you can achieve that because it cannot be achieved alone. That. That's a great, great answer. Um, I'm actually going to extend that question to Sean as well, because Sean, you have the, the privilege of, um, teaching so many uh, students from all walks of life. Um, but I'm curious to know if the advice that you have received um, in your career 
if it's the same one that you pass on to your students and if so what is it yeah i mean you know i feel like i'm still always constantly like getting advice and like looking at you know but uh, i look to books for that and i'll look at you know i'm reading this um journals the journals of jonas mikas right now and like every single entry is like a mind-blowing like piece of advice on like how one can think about their career. Um, so when I think of like the advice that I've received, one thing that had always really stuck with me is to like make good work that you're gonna be 100% proud of, that feels authentically you that really couldn't have been made by anyone else. Um, I think sometimes we try to make that work, but we're always thinking of market considerations. We're like, oh, well, you know, maybe I should soften this or I need to do this and this will help it more saleable or, oh, I saw that show does this thing. So I need to incorporate that too. But like, you don't really get to make the standout work by trying to follow all the things that other people are doing because that's already been done. But like the way you specifically see those world as unfiltered, your world as unfiltered as possible to make that and to make something that you 100% stand behind, um, and are proud of, and you don't watch and be like, oh, you know, I compromise. I compromise my vision in some way. Um, I think that's really important, especially for those folks that want to get more into the writing and the directing is, you know, you, we're always thinking of audiences, but you also got to think of what is the part of you that you are putting out there that you are turning into art in some way. Yeah, that's great. Um... Kevella, I would love to know from you, what is the piece of advice that you have implemented in your life, uh, in your career specifically also, that you think um, would really benefit others? Yeah, um, thanks for asking that, it's Kevella speaking. Um, I would say, know your values. Um, and that sounds, that sounds simple, but I think when you say, hey, like, when you know your values, you then know what you can say yes to and then what you want to say no to. And that was really clear for me where, you know, I have a tech degree, you know, I was going to go into the tech world and I was able to say, hey, I'm going to leave JP Morgan. I'm going to go internship list, which is not the end of the world. Right. But um, and lo and behold, that ended me up at HBO. Like I would have never if I didn't say to myself, hey, I value impact. I value you know, pushing, seeing love and truth perpetuate itself inside the spaces that I'm in and community care. Like I would have, I wouldn't be in front of you right now. I would have known, not known real works. I would have not known anything. But if I was trying to chase the bag that I never had and said, hey, like I'm, I want to make, you know, X amount of money coming out of school because my parents never made that. I'm the first generation college student, all this type of things. Then I wouldn't have been able to to make that decision, but I was firm in saying, hey, like, I want to say I'm, I'm going to make this step because I asked myself those value-based questions of our relationship to money, my proximity to my family, what's that one thing I want to perpetuate through my work? Um, and that's the biggest advice I'd say, because if you live in your values, like, that's the win. Amen to that. <laughs> Um, that's like final question for everyone. What things should individuals and like slash companies do to help shape a better future? So perhaps um, Shelly, yes. Would you like to answer that final question? Yes, I think what people can do is be more human. I saw a quote that said too many people, I think that I saw it a few months ago and it said, um, too many people are too many people, not enough soul. And it reminds me of what needs to be done to dismantle the establishment that we need to stop doing what has been established. So, and when you see that representation, it's not a zero sum game. Everybody needs to feel seen and to be part of a society, they need to listen and share and exchange. And what people can do is to make sure that other people feel seen. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's so true, is um, making space for others as you make space for yourself, correct? Any final thoughts? Yes, Kaya. 
And to add on to Shelly's point, um, I would say that sharing your story is very, very valuable because we are all individuals. We are all different, um, but there's always someone who can relate to our personal stories. Um, and so, you know, though outreach can be difficult, we have a silly thing called social media, anything that, you know, can, you know, put your story out there, put your interest out there, uh, it will cling on to someone um, and hopefully inspire them to tell theirs and, it, you know, will create a chain reaction. So um, never be afraid to kind of put yourself out there. Yes, absolutely. Andy, Sean, Kevel, any parting thoughts on what, you know, if not companies, at least individuals can do to, to make a difference and just make the whole inclusivity, access, equity, all those topics we've been covering tonight better. Yes, Andy, and then Sean. Yeah, I, I was just thinking of being open to doing things differently and new ways of doing things. Um, for Through Justice Film Collective, I'm working on creating an ethical filmmaking framework that centers these different tenets of equity, joy, accountability with the script that we're putting on the screen and also the way that we're behaving, you know, on set um, behind the camera. And a lot of the time, not all the time, thankfully, but a lot of the time when I'm speaking, to people that work on bigger budget film sets or you know other producers about it, I get a response that's like, I just don't know how you're gonna be able to make your day or get all the shots you need to make your movie if you're doing those things, if you're taking time to whatever it is that I need to take time for, whether it's giving the crew more breaks, whether it's taking a longer time to eat, whether it's actually having processes for conflict resolution or you know what to do when harm happens. Like the response is, I don't know how you're going to get your movie made if, if you do those things. And, and my response is generally, well, you know, I'm definitely not going to be able to create any social change if I don't try. So it might not be perfect the first time around or the second time around. But for me, and I think hopefully for other individuals and companies too, it's worth it to imagine new ways of doing things so that we can shift dominant culture and the way that it impacts filmmaking. Yeah, well said. Sean, I could see you nodding feverishly at uh, Andy's comments. I presume you share the same sentiments. Yeah, I mean, I totally co-sign that, that point of view that, um, you know, there's new forms. You know, we, we think of old forms and we try to put ourselves in old forms, but we're trying to create a new vision of what that media landscape could be, what cinema and movie making could be. And so I think one thing is like from an artistic perspective, how do we start to break away from like old forms that were, you know, created by like, you know, a white dominant uh, culture, right? So um, how are we creating these new forms or incorporating other forms into what we're doing and always just find a way to, to make the thing. Cause you know, if you want to make a movie and you need to get that story out, like you're not going to say, oh, well, I didn't raise my like $500,000 budget for this movie. I guess I can't make it right. Like, no, you're going to find a way to do it. And it's probably going to feel so much more essential because it needs to come into existence in some way. Um, I also think it's really important. So I spoke a little bit about the companies earlier, just like, you know, making sure to like provide that opportunity and space to bring on folks that might seem a little bit more green, but um, also as individuals, how do we, how are we supporting each other's work, right? You know, we always get so caught up in like, oh, well, I'm working on this thing and I gotta do this, but like, are we going to other like film festivals? Are we going to like these local meetups? Are we trying to be in the spaces where we're supporting other, um, other artists and um, uh, in the space that's trying to do similar things to us. You know, it can't just be about us and the things that we wanna do. We have to realize that we are part of this larger community. And the more we sort of integrate with that, the better it's going to be. Um, and then another thing for individuals too, is like for us to understand that this is our craft and medium and um, we need to love it and we need to immerse ourselves in it. And it's not just about like the things that exist now, but there's so much to, to what we do and um, we don't know everything and there's always going to be something to learn. So to always stay open-minded and to just really like, you know, 
love your medium and to like try to learn as much about it as you possibly can because there's always going to be more um and you could watch a movie that seemingly has no relevance to your life maybe from like the 20s or something but there's still going to be something you can take away from it right like some reaction something it made you think of that could change the way you that might inform your art in some capacity so yeah for for me i think just making sure we support each other's uh work as well um, and also just making sure that we um, immerse ourselves in our medium. That's great advice. That's great advice. And thank you so much for sharing that. I feel like that is a um, a really positive, uplifting um, place to to end this conversation on. Um, I could continue because all of you, I just I love your perspectives that you brought to the table, your insight. Thank you so much for being honest for being transparent um and for sharing with us your you know your personal journeys um it i'm sure i mean it meant a lot to me to hear your stories and i can only imagine um how it was received by the rest of our audience so thank you andy keval kaya shelly and sean um the conversation doesn't have to end here though because um, I do want to just quickly transition to the next segment of our program, which is how everyone can um, learn a little bit more about real works and also participate, in particular, um, our Media Makers program. So let me share with you how you all can get involved. Great, thank you for that introduction. Uh, and what an incredible panel and, and so many um, incredible insights. So thank you to everyone who joined us today. So hello, my name is Siobhan Kavanaugh. Uh, I'm, I'm with RealWorks. Uh, I'm the program manager for the Career Exploration Program, which is our internship program. Um, I am against a green background. I have a white and blue uh, striped shirt um, and green glasses and curly hair. Um, so Media Makers is a partnership between RealWorks, the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment, City University of New York, unions and media industry professionals to train and credential early career professionals for careers in the media and entertainment industry. Uh, so we are promoting a more diverse media industry through career connections. Last year, we supported 151 internships placed in 75 companies, uh, over 75 companies actually. Um, additionally, 53% of our career exploration program graduates have gotten full or part-time work in the media industry. And many of our graduates actually are still in school and are not um, quite ready for full-time work. So we've had really great successes um, in the program. We also run a career development program, which uh, has helped to train uh, many early career professionals in specific in-demand careers uh, and connect them to film unions um, and also connect them to jobs in their, their trained careers. Uh, so to learn a little bit more about the program, uh, I would like to share a video that will describe more about our workforce development initiatives and how you can get involved. Feature story tonight focuses on a life-changing program here in the city. It's called Media Makers. Media Makers is the workforce development program within RealWorks in partnership with the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment and CUNY. Media Makers brings together employers, labor unions, educators, and government to train and credential a diverse workforce for the media industry. The career exploration program means a lot to me, especially because when I actually started interning and I saw the resources and I saw people that look like me in these positions, I feel a lot better. And now I feel like, what am I going to choose versus how am I gonna get there? Since the program began, we have provided 400 young New Yorkers with the knowledge, skills, and experience to succeed in the workplace. More than 75 companies have joined Media Makers to host 320 paid internships and create job training programs. 85% of those who have completed our internship program and nearly 90% of our job training graduates are actively working at companies including HBO Max, Amazon Studios, Netflix, and Showtime. 
and we have issued more than 1,600 industry-backed digital credentials representing real skills that employers seek. Being a part of the Warner Media post-production training program has helped me be more confident. Within the last year, I've learned so much. I don't think that I would be as resourceful as I am now in my current position. My internships have been one of my favorite parts about the program. I've learned so much in every single one and I'm so thankful to everyone at the at the companies that I work for and at Media Makers too. This year we expect to serve 950 students and early career professionals. We will continue our core access programs such as the Studio Mechanics Boot Camp with IATSE, sponsored by Netflix, and the Viacom CBS Content for Change Academy. We also have new partnerships, including a union training slated for 2022. Together, let's build a media workforce that is as diverse as the city we live in. Well, thank you, Siobhan, for sharing about our Media Makers program. Uh, my name is Abby. I'm the program director here at RealWorks. I have light hair, green shirt. My bike is behind me, and I'm tuning in from the RealWorks office. I've had the pleasure of working closely with our youth ambassadors for this event, and we'd like to know, what would you like our next town hall to focus on? So we, we're going to send out a, one last poll here for you guys, y'all to answer. And as you're answering that poll, I just want to speak on behalf of RealWorks. And thank you all for participating in tonight and joining our community for these amazing conversations, especially our moderators, our panelists, our ambassadors. We'll share this recording post event and we'd like, um, and we'll be reaching out for your feedback. But big thank you for the ambassadors for coming up with this topic and having important conversations um, for these past several months, really. And because of those conversations, this event happened. So thanks again, Noor, Shu, Maya, Aman, Chi, Sean, Octavia, Kaya, Bree. So awesome. I, we feel so fortunate to work with these aspiring students and real work staff. And we hope you join us again for the future events. Uh, this month, we have screenings leading up to our signature event, the Real Works Change Makers Gala on May 25th. The gala will be super fun, classy, and creative in person and live streamed. There will be real work youth correspondents work reporting live from the red carpet. This event is happening at Tribeca 316 NYC and our honoree Charles D. King, president of Macro and MC is Brian Terrell Clark, Hollywood and Broadway star. Mingle with celebrities, company partners like Paramount, Warner Media, Netflix, AMC Networks, and most importantly, rub shoulders with us the next generation of creative leaders. See it for yourself. Turn your attention to preview this exciting event. This night is about celebrating great artists and about the future and diversity in our kids. What I love about Real Works is that when I went in there, there are 15 and 16 year olds making their own movies. A woman came up to me and she told me that she had watched my film, like it really moved her and that she reflected on something that had happened similarly to her. And that felt like the winning moment for me. This means so much, particularly because the Real Works program promotes inclusion and community and fostering community. And that has been such an essential part of my own journey in this industry. Gabby's work and success has shown so many young black girls, including myself, that there is power in being different from the norm. I talked to a few of the kids tonight. They're already writers and directors and editors. I cannot wait to stand beside you guys on the Oscars red carpet. I cannot wait to pay a ticket to see your story. Adults in the space, if you're interested in getting involved or joining, please reach out to our team. I will drop it in the chat. Uh, students, please join us again next Tuesday for the Doc Lab screening at the Museum of Modern Art, 
where the other lab students and I will be premiering our films. Before we close, on behalf of the Youth Ambassadors, thank you for the support of our board members, Sherezi Tandon, and all the others, and all of those who are able to attend tonight. Special thanks to, to Paramount and Warner Media. Thanks to ASL provided by Brandon Kazen Maddox and Body Language Productions Incorporated. Voice interpreter for Shelly Guy, Jamie Rose Hayes, and ASL interpreters Juanita Aguilar and Camille. Um, Malav. Thank you. Thanks to Real Work staff for making this event come together so smoothly. Christy, Stefan, Mara, Joey, and Sovan. Thank you to Charles and Abby for the guidance and the education side. And lastly, shout out to John Williams and Stephanie Walter, our founders for creating Real Works. <laughs>